Hey guys, how are you doing? This is Zed from Zed Outdoors and I hope you're having an awesome day. So I am once again with a dear friend of mine, Chris Allen. Chris, how are you doing? Very well, thank you. Now you may have seen Chris on a previous video, which has been a very well received video, which is how to make a shrink pot. Now leading on from that, this is a second video that we're recording with Chris, and that is how to carve a whale tail shaped coffee scoop. Yeah, I said it in one go. You got it through in one was it? I like that. That was, that was, that was a tongue twister, <laughs> that one. Uh, this is Chris, uh, something he's quite well known for. Uh, I own one myself. It's a beautiful, beautiful item. Very functional, very aesthetically, very good looking as well. Now, the idea with this tutorial is to walk you through in detail, step by step, how to carve one of these yourself using some basic tools. So the guide here is not just from an entertainment point of view, you can see Chris carving, but also you can see all the nuances involved on how to carve one itself. There are obviously a subtle nuances involved. Um, yeah, it's always from carving very basic objects. So Chris, with his many years of experience, is going to show you through. So I hope you enjoy the rest of the video where Chris is going to teach you how to carve one. So Chris, this so, beautiful object here is something you carved yourself, isn't it? That's right. So. I started carving these after being inspired by Martin Hazel and he sold me a scoop that he'd made from a beautiful bit of burr that just had a little bit of a flare to the end and I was looking at it thinking well, if I put a notch in there I can make it into, into a tail shape and it's all evolved from there so now I do quite a flared fluke for the handle and the idea as a coffee scoop is that you can hold it and get into your jar or bag of coffee um, it's a generous measure of coffee because um, it will it'll make quite a strong cup um, but I've seen people use them for loose leaf tea that's what mine's for um, and for flour as a measure and all those sorts of things I think you use yours um, for, for all different things um, in your kit and uh, yeah I've uh, I've just refined the design I like the curve in the bowl and, and the handle it just adds a little bit of movement now as a carver I don't do 3d animals or anything that I consider particularly artistic um, so this has got a nod towards what I think um, is is uh, fancy carving basically um, but still retaining that strong functionality um, and they go really well. The people um, really admire them on the stall, um, and uh, they're a mainstay of what I do. So yeah, we're going to walk through uh, how I get from from birch log to this stage. So, the first step is obviously cleaving the wood. That's right. This is a section of birch which you used in the previous video. Uh, it's five and a half, five inches across. Um, and what I need to do is find uh, a clean section that um, I can take a rectangle from, which is the outside shape uh, of the scoop. And to do that, I'll use a quarter of a log this size. Um, you can do them on half a smaller diameter log if you want to. Now, as a green woodworker, I have a fro handy. Fro is a really good way of splitting timber, um, and the width of the blade will generate a split that goes all the way across the timber. You can, if you want to, use an ax, uh, to do this um, and that will work but a fro once you've buried the head into the wood has a handle sticking up vertically which allows you to um, lever any problematic logs apart it works really well on much longer timber and bigger timber as well so I'm going to hit it with uh, with my favorite mallet um, which is surviving quite nicely and we're just going to bury the fro to the back edge of the blade you can see the split in this short piece of timber has run pretty much all the way through sometimes if you listen carefully I just heard a few more little tinkles of the wood splitting um, but it's not going to go any further without some assistance so because this is so short you can just see how the fro works by pulling um, backwards or forwards pushing on the handle um, you can get right through and that gives you a nice clean cleft and that's partly in uh, partly because of the, the the blade going all the way across the timber. So we'll just have a quick look at the outside of the logs. Um, we've got some scarring um, here. That will be a knot. Um, you can see there's a wobble here, which will be a knot here. Um, so I think, yeah, we'll probably get a good clean section above this knot, but. Um, We'll put, um, 
yeah, I think we'll, we'll, we'll open up this side and see how we go. Um, and then we can always use another bit if it doesn't work. So back on with the fro, just go into quarters this time. Open that up. So the fro is a fairly blunt tool um, and as a result it can be put on the ground. I wouldn't do that with an axe. Um, again, this is looking fairly straight. Um, we've got an inclusion here, which is a fissure in the bark where the tree's been damaged. You see here, and then it's added growth on top, so there'll be a weak spot there, but I quite like that piece. And we've got the knots, you can just see the waves in the wood where there's wobbles, so I'll use that for a spoon or two in future. And this is the piece that we'll be using. So what I'll do is, um, I'll use the curvature here as one side, the cleft as another, and I'll just split this off. So with using the fro in the previous two cuts, we've had 50% weight of timber either side of the blade. Um, so first in half and then second into quarter. Here we're going to do an offset cleft, which will mean that there's more timber on this side of the blade than this one. And what should happen is that the split will run off. And I'm hoping that if you get a nice angle um, onto that, you'll be able to see that happen as I hit the fro into the wood. So here we go. The depth between the cleft surface and the fro blade should be deep enough for our scoop. And what I'll do is I'll bury this into the wood. Let's see if that's working. Can you see how the split's running off like that? Um, that's because this portion of timber is bending more than the other side. And that's fairly consistent and typical. So what will happen as I lay this down, you see how you get that ski ramp effect. And that's worth bearing in mind just for greenwood splitting that you do generally. Um, it's a nice little visual representation there. So that section's cool, that section's slightly off. However, we've got a reference line on here. So if I grab my axe and back onto my trusty wildlife hatchet, I can then use this cleft surface um, on this side as a guide and just match that and go down from there. So here, my axe is going to a lot of um, weight of timber. So what I'll do is I'll put it over to the side and just break the weight of timber up with these stop cuts. And then as my axe goes down, you see how the timber bends away, there's less weight to it. And I'll just be able to chop a straight line from there. And then the other thing to do is just take the bark off now the bark is very soft compared to the wood, so you need to be extra careful with your fingers. Um, and then we'll do the rest of the trimming up with the draw knife. So Chris, we're going to do the next section on your shave balls, and I was just admiring your shave balls. Um, if you guys have been watching my channel, then you know obviously I've done a video that's been an extremely well received video from a mutual friend, Neil Mapes. Um, on making a bodger style shave horse. Um, so is this one you made yourself then? Yeah, this is one that I went on a course with Mike Abbott and uh, came away with back in 2006 uh, or perhaps a bit earlier, I think. And um, this is Mike's shave horse 2000 pattern that's available mm. in his book. Um, so Mike did the, the chainsaw work on the, uh, uh, the, the log that becomes the body. So unlike a traditional English pattern that's got a plank with a ramp that you mm -hmm. made, this is a solid lump of timber. Now it's splitting, but that's fine, it's stuck together. Um, and you don't have the adjustment on the ramp with the block underneath, um, but it is a single piece. It works really well, and I'm able to put a lot of power behind my um, work because there's no risk of the, the block moving around and putting stress onto the, um, onto the joint at the end. Um, but apart from that, the configuration is the same. It's a, a frame and three legs into a body which, uh, which you use with a draw knife. Um, so yeah, there's some, I'm not sure, the head is original. Um, I've replaced the other components, but this is one of the first bits of turning that I did. I had some help with the shaving and the cleaving, um, but a thoroughly enjoyable process that I used in ads. And the horse isn't the best in the world. It can be more refined, but it just does the job and it keeps doing the job and I love it. Um, it's sort of part of my journey, if, uh, if you hear me. 
So um, yeah, basically I'll hop on and show you what I'm going to do with this billet. So um, it's slightly wonky, it just needs truing up. Um, and I'll do a little bit of shaping to even it up and then I'll have some smooth surfaces which I can do the marking out that I need to on. And to stress obviously you can, you know, most people can do this with an axe basically. Yes, you know, yeah so. it's only because I've got my shape horse here and I'm fairly used to doing it. Another point, this bit of wood I'm going to draw two whales on and do them tail to tail. Um, I do also do this on four, I do four whales all in one row if that makes sense. Um, and it just means that you've got something to hold on to while you axe onto quite a small um, shape. Um, but also from a production point of view, I can take a log that's sort of like 30 centimetres long and a bit, a bit longer actually, but um, make four items do all the processing in one place. And just from a production point of view, makes things a bit faster. Now, for my draw knife today, I'm using a Svante Jarve uh, mini draw knife. Um, I can't remember the exact dimensions but it's much smaller than a standard English pattern. Um, it's an awesome tool. Um, I make um, my gypsy flowers with this tool. Um, it's integral to how I make those. I'm just uh, getting fouled on a lot a little bit. Um, but we'll just smooth that off, spin the work round um, and come back the other way. And I use this tool bevel up. It works really well. Um, and then on the sides, so I don't mind a little bit of a bark staying on. We're going to chamfer um, to get the curve of the bowl in here so it's not too much of an issue. And we might, this is probably a little bit too wide for the scoop, so probably take that off. But rather than taking it all off for the sake of it and then ending up with something that's very narrow for the sake of taking off uh, all the bark down to that, um, that line, we'll be fine where we are for now. So not only are we sort of eliminating any wind in the wood um, that might throw out the marking up process and we're also giving ourselves a smooth surface to work off um, which just means you, you draw once you don't have to worry about these little marks and things. be back on a shave horse. I've spent most of the winter whittling sticks and moving logs around and things like that. I've not done that much making on the horse. So yeah, that's all good. So that's fairly good. It's got a little lump in the middle. Um, but maybe we'll make that at the top and we'll see how it goes. So Chris, you're going to be marking up the the designer using your pattern. That's right. And I use a template in uh, flexible plastic. Um, as you can see, it's about nine centimetres long. Uh, the circle is about 4.6 centimetres, which seems to work quite nicely. Obviously, it's sort of half the half the length of the scoop, um, and then you just have to draw the tail on as you like it. And what I'm going to be doing is using these dividers to um, uh, to basically stabilise the template as I work, um, and then I'll draw around the outside of it, um, and then I'll reverse the template. Um, and pop it on there so that I've got two back to back and you'll see how that helps me work uh, going forwards. So what I will do, just mark a centre line roughly. Oh. About there. This just helps me line the templates up. You know, if you're designing, you'd do that a little, you know, your own freehand design, you'd do that a little bit more carefully. So you've got two holes in the plastic, basically, to, yeah. to allow you, okay. And what's this, you're, you're using a compass? Or? These, no, a compass has got a pencil in it, these are dividers, um, which you can fix at a, a certain distance and then offer it up to measure things. You've seen them used on old maps in nautical movies and stuff where they sort of walk the compasses, mm -hmm. the dividers across. Um, but yeah, you pick them up. I've got a couple of packs um, in my marking out kit. Um, but a compass, this one's an old draftsman's one, um, has a spike and a pencil. And I'll use this just to, um, I'll show you. Um, to get the, the inner circle working 
So I'm just going around with a pencil. I do like to use a Sharpie marker for this, usually, um, but I appear to have used it in the house rather than left it in my kit. So we'll be using a pencil today. I'll just shift that round. And the nice thing about having this pinned, you know, there's no technicality to this. This is just for pinning it down in the wood. Um, it also provides a point in which to put the compass, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, so yeah, that's that's the template drawn. And then what I do is offer the compass up. And then the compass is circular, so you go around like that, you can see I'm either off or the template's slightly out. It just gives you something to work to. And then I just reduce that down, and that'll give me another line to work to. So Chris, so you marked out both both scoops. That's it, so I just did what I did a, a moment ago, um, again, tail to tail, and then I've added these lines. So I'm gonna take a, a saw and put a stop cut in here, so that when I use an ax to chop this way, any splits that are generated won't take the tail out or vice versa the bowl. So we'll have an air gap caused by the saw here. And that's fairly obvious, it's fairly common as well to, um, to do that, um, to protect a curve here, the, the concave curve. But additionally, um, I'm gonna put a saw cut across the back. And if you imagine the scoop sitting here like this, the other one, the tail going that way, I'm gonna put a relief or a saw cut in here so that I can ax down onto it from both sides. The more you can do with the ax, the quicker the product is to make, because the ax removes wood very quickly, um, but doesn't do so accurately. So we get so far with the ax and then do the rest with the knife. So this stage is going to, I'm going to use a silky pocket boy saw um, to just start sawing into these uh, concave curves. Close as you dare. And that just does that side. And then the one across the back, you just have to be a bit careful. If you go too deep, it's fine for the tail, because it's going to be, they're going to be sawn in half anyway, but then you weaken the billet, and as you hit it with the axe, you can get fractures that way, so it's a sort of a balance to be had. So about halfway usually for me is good enough. So they're the saw cuts down into the tail and then we're going to ax this way and that way into this saw cut. So a couple of nice axes you got here Chris. Yeah and uh, yeah good friends both. Um, so I've been using my wildlife hatchet throughout the videos that we've been doing together um, but I thought I'd put it next to this smaller hatchet and I can't remember what these are called uh, whether it's a hand hatchet or a belt hatchet um, because I bought this one quite a while ago um, but it's favoured on courses people pick it up because it's nice and light but the lighter the axe the higher the frequency you have to chop with it because it doesn't do as much work so for me it's fairly rare that I pick this one up um, but it comes into its own for scoops because they're small um, and the, the, the size is appropriate to the task. So um, let's just take this one out of the way and put it back in its sheath. A quick shout out to Max. Your sheath still doing the job, Max. Well done, thank you very much. And then we'll get on with uh, the task at hand. So... Um, what I can do is chop down the side. You see this bit that we were talking about with the bark, the curvature of the bark still on, um, is superfluous to requirement. So I can take that out 
and just break the fibres up and then chop. down close to the line and then less need to chop the fibres up on this side there we go. okay so that just trims to, to size and then what I like to do for these um, it's quite this, this is quite deep um, in terms of the depth between my fingers so I'm going to do the back first which just um, take some of the the effort out of cutting um, into the side so what you'll see is from if I hit this saw line at the back I know I'm halfway up the tail so I don't want to be too deep there but it's a good place to start and that just starts the um, the bottom of the stem of the tail and then the flat of the tail will be right at the end there. And we turn this around, and again, starting at the same place. Oh, so I just wandered a little bit above, but that's not a problem. I just have to be careful not to glance off and strike into here um, and wreck the other scoop. Like that it does happen from time to time. That's to be expected. Okay. So now I've got less material around the tail for chopping in. So what I'll do is I'll show you how I go about this. And rather than holding it here and being careful and trying to get all the way across the, the, the width of this small blade all the way across, I tend to lie it down and come in at an angle that allows me to be slightly more accurate. You see what's going on here? So you've got a chamfer across rather than all the way across like that but then as you chop down the rest comes off and you see how this line is slightly off a bit more chopping in and that line is now perfect is at 90 degrees to your flat so it's a good little tip you can't do it on the other side very easily just helps so this side it's harder to do yeah but what I can do is turn the whole thing around and use the same technique for the tail so I'm using the very tip of the axe to lead with and I'm moving to the edge of the block so that the the is it heel and heel and toe, top and bottom, I can never remember which way around it goes, um, but I'm just clearing the bottom of the blade of the axe by working on the edge of the block, yeah? And then again, we come in this side. As you can see, I'm quite close to my hands. The safety here is that the the uh, axe, if it slips, will go into the block. It's very unlikely to hit my leg, and I'd have to overreach by quite a lot to get the um, to get the hand. The, there's a good amount of timber in between there. So, last one on this technique. Okay, and then just to tidy this up, I can come that way. I've gone below the line of the saw cut there, so just break those fibres up. Okay, and again, I'm at a bit of a diagonal. Instead of coming down like that or dead across, I'm at a bit of an angle. Just allows me to cut progressively across the grain rather than all at one go. And then if I twist round, I can come the other way, I won't foul myself too much, just have to see the other side of that. These are actually too deep, I'm going to have to take a little bit of depth out of these, but that's what I've not done them for a while. So, 
and then I can do the nose of these ones, the other end. So this for me is one of the trickiest things to do. I need to float my axe just off the line of this cut and not overcut. So it's just a little bit trickier and sometimes I like to just place the axe, pick the wood up and then go down like that. And then it's easier to find that surface. So here I'm coming down onto the grain and it's breaking off but it's resisting so that's where that angled cut really helps instead of smashing the fibres and potentially breaking bits off and then here I'll just have to stand that up oh, that was close and this is a good example so in, if I had one scoop I'd be holding it here and working close to my hand because I've got two my, my fingers are much further away yeah so now the troublesome bits are these bits that are left and what I like to do is hang the whole piece of work off the edge of the chopping block and then if I need to I can still see how I've rotated it and I can present the tool at an angle and as long as I am careful work like that well, it's amazing how you forget to talk when you're concentrating <laughs> so yeah it's just about carefully working in there um, and then I've got a little bit of excess material between the tails and I'll just tap my axe through there okay. okay and then this side this is one of the more risky cuts um, I like a sharp edge rather than a uh, than a slope um, just because you catch catch the corner nicely but this is the closest I get to my hands um, so this is the harder cut to make from my point of view okay. so can you see how that that's a an angled cut and I'm aiming at the corner and um, making that angle um, so that there's less material to cut and then coming back in and nibbling away until it's a lot flatter you see how that it still goes off at a slight angle I can just pick that up gently it's worth getting this right because the keep saying the axe removes material much quicker than the knife but if you're not confident or you've got a heavy axe you can do this with the knife it just takes a little bit longer that's all yep so the um, the depth on these scoops I realize now is a bit too deep so what I'll do is I'll just place the axe and tap through um, and again instead of throwing the axe and trying to hit a line by placing it and then pulling the wood up underneath it and slamming down you end up um, with an accurate cut that cleaves and then you can just uh, smooth that off and I'll just take a little bit more so that's referred to as a drop cut yes yeah and the technique really is you place and put a little bit of pressure on with the axe but then you pick the wood up against the downward force of the axe um, and drop the the whole thing onto the block I just have to check for evenness that's pretty good so yeah it just makes some of the the knife work easier uh, you act like a, a bit of a knife and just see if you can work through those or if you're very gentle just tap away and take the points out because they take three or four passes with the knife or more 
Um, this axe isn't really long enough to do it, but you can use a like a guillotine action. You see that? So the tip of the axe is in the block. Um, it doesn't work all the way around. Um, it will work on that orientation. Um, and then the, the end of the axe just it works much better with a larger axe and a curved bit. But yeah, you can trim up. I don't mind a little bit of knife work. This is fresh birch, so it works out okay. And you can spend time getting into this concave if you want. I know that by the time I come to do that, I would have refined some of the weight off the bottom. So after that, I like to put some chamfers on with the ax. And just to start everything off, one side, to other side, and then the nose. So you've got three facets, and then I just take that line off to join the join them in. And they can be fairly rough. Um, and then following this facet, the tail on the finished scoops is going to have a ridge line going through here. So just cut in. I want to cut too steeply, and then can pick up from there and thin the tail out. So you can see now I've got a facet coming around here and a bit of blending um, with the tail. You can take a little bit more off here if you want to, but you've got to remember that if you want that curved top line and the tail not to be right up at the top, you need to allow for some depth to come off the top. So you don't want to go too thin between my thumbs there um, and you'll scoop some out of here as well. So see how you get on with that. Enjoy playing with the form. go on the ground they pick up dirt the white birch will pick up the dust and that will get on my knives so yeah saw those in half you can see the tails are quite chunky there sometimes I use the axe just to chamfer those back um, and then use the template to redraw the tails but we'll see how we get on in the next section so now the knife work then Chris yep on with the trusty 106 so I've done the um, the majority of the the, the heavy work with the axe um, and now I'm going to work with the knife and what I like to do is work um, to the pencil line and I'll do that across the the depth of the tool uh, of the scoop and then I'll put some marking I'll mark out some lines that will help me generate the curve um, so yeah here I'm going to use a, a thumb pivot cut um, you'll see my fingers are tucked out of the way and uh, that means I'm going to use uh, a sort of up and down motion with my wrist and I'm going to use the thumb of my holding hand as a fulcrum around which the blade can pivot and then just subtle movements to ease the the work piece around you see how I'm working at a diagonal and peeling down I'm not going directly down which can break this lower edge off I'm going at a diagonal or a sort of skew cut through the grain this is super soft birch, it's nice and sappy. And I'm looking to try and maintain 90 degrees between the horizontal and the vertical surfaces um, just so that uh, I can maintain control. Work around like that. So it's up to you as to whether you cut to the pencil line um, or cut all the pencil off. The key is really consistency and make sure that you do it all the way around so that you get an even cut. There we go. Okay, so in the same way, if you remember in the uh, shrink pot video, we're working in different quarters. The grain is going up and down like this. Um, in this orientation um, so I start on the side and work forward um, because I don't want to um, start round here because I'll potentially if I introduced a wedge here um, I'd generate a split with, that take the apex off this corner which I don't want to do so whilst I'm thumb pivoting I'll go to the opposite corner uh, sometimes I like to think of uh, a clock face um, so you've got six o'clock twelve o'clock or um, uh, points on a compass 
and work at the cardinal points and generally you're working from an apex down into a, uh, a concave um, or from top uh, from uphill to downhill um, so maintaining the thumb pi pivot, pivot um, stance I can work from round the side down into the bottom and then when you get here I, I tend to move around a little bit um, and just the, the thumb pivot changes it's a bit of a pushy cut as well so I am applying a little bit of pressure with my left thumb or my, my holding hand thumb um, just to get down through this tighter um, part of the curve you see here I've withdrawn the blade so I'm using the tip which is thinner the width is thinner on the tip and that means it will go round the curve um, a little bit more sweetly so the safety here obviously um, you're cutting away from your hand but you do have to be careful not to push the tip of the blade and catch yourself um, I've done that once on a cookser and have a scar um, along here because of it um, so just watch out um, in theory you shouldn't be putting a lot of pressure on so you shouldn't have um, too much room for slipping but there's always a chance you know, especially if you're doing something new so this curve done that curve done I'll just take a little bit more out of there if I can and then we just need to change uh, knife grip so I'm gonna go to a, a can opener or a pairing cut um, you see here the blade could catch my thumb if I came all the way off but in principle the blade is your thumb is out of the way of the path of the blade and it allows me to work from the side back up to the top if you imagine the grain is coming this way so you're slicing through the fiber at the top and it's pushing it onto the one at the, underneath and allowing the cut as opposed to going the other way where the last fiber is unsupported and would break off and again maintaining that 90 degree between the horizontal and vertical I'll show you that once I've finished this curve so by working on the ridges you take wood that's not supported either side and that's a general principle that's quite good and then you generate another ridge and work on that you see how instead of making a really long thick plow cut like that which you might see it's taking quite a lot of effort in the muscles of my hands uh, and on strain on my fingers by taking those corners all the time it's work making you work a little bit easy more easy especially on the end grain which is hard as a cut and the end grain is where the fibers are presenting and you're literally slicing across two fibers uh, or the ends of the fibers which is tougher So I've been referencing this 90 degree between the horizontal and vertical plane and I can show you that by turning it sideways and you should be able to see, all right, it's not perfect, there are, there are bits that I can see as a flare here and a bit of a dig there, um, but the general idea is that you want to be carving square. So the square, it's two sides, it's a, it's a right angle, so you've got one side and then the other side and the square you can keep it all the way through the process, the more control you can exert. And what I'll do is I'll show you where I mark these walls up and how I convert that into a curve again it just means that you can take off an equal mount all the way around um, and convert that into a nice round shape that you see on the final product and you don't have to just sort of hack away at that and hope for the best and then spend ages getting that to work so you'll see that coming to fruition in the later in the process so I've come fairly close to the line all the way around that's looking pretty good and I've just got that last corner left to do and again um, this one's slightly trickier you can do it as a can opener or a pairing cut but you're slightly fouled on the tail so alternatively you can go back to that thumb pivot but you're now working blind so I can't see 
um, the pencil line. So it swings and roundabouts. So I find this easier in terms of the access. But I just have to be careful about coming too close to the line or undercutting the line. And here I'm having to choke the knife. So you can see I've brought the knife down into my holding hand um, and I'm just having to make sure I don't grip too tightly with that finger. Um, and that's how it works. And that allows me to bring the tip into play. Remember we talked about having it in the tighter curve this side. And sometimes you'll just go, I can't do that because you've not had it as much practice. Your tendons might not, might not be as strong or you might not be as confident um, to do that. It, it does build up, that carving strength will build up um, as you practice. So yeah, that's most of the perimeter um, pretty much where it needs to be. There's just a little bit on the top here. I'll just pick out and check. And I like to carry on now, so um, you basically keep going round the tail and we're just working the other way to how we have been. Um, I'm using a thumb push, technically you see how the thumb is pushing the blade down the, the curve um, and then the same here, it's, it's more of a push. The pivot is like that and the push is across. If that makes sense um, but again working with grain direction in mind and then blending those surfaces together carving around so you will see that that technically is not very safe but I just I'm just picking up a little curve just to release the fiber that's pushing the other way just no power at all on that and if you don't feel that that's safe turn it round do the thumb pivot the other way um, it it requires a bit of focus and an acknowledgement that you're doing something you could cut yourself with and then mitigating that so a tricky cut that I find is this portion round here um, and you have to sort of hold the scoop in a, a sort of like a pistol grip um, style and push through and that can take a little bit of effort to master. You could also take this to your chopping block, <coughs> excuse me, and lay it down and then push the knife down into the block so that your hand is further away and your grip is stronger um, against the block. But you can refine this, we're going to work the top and the bottom of um, this section so if you want to you can leave that um, and wait until it's much thinner to work on this portion here you have to work the other way so it's around a curve and just use the tip to take thin slivers so for me speed is important so I don't like to stop and change if I can help it just so now just this side to do and these, they, I hate, I prefer doing the curve of the bowl to this bit, but you can't have everything your own way. And then just change the grip and see how I'm reinforcing um, this pairing cut with my holding hand fingers um, because you're going to come off into air and you could catch yourself if your thumb's there, that sort of thing. So it's just about um, doing what's safe. So there's just lack of control as you come out of that cut, so it's worth mitigating it. And then I'm going to work blind again. I kind of know this shape very well, um, so I'll just go with the thumb pushy pivot. That's working out alright. And then go back to that can opener cut. And again, choking the knife so that the um, the blade is 
presenting the tip. If you've got a smaller knife, maybe the Moro 120 would work there. I do have a smaller blade um, that then you don't have to choke the blade with. That, that can help. Having said that, the Moro 106, the blade profile is great for carving. Um, and I don't tend to recommend the 120 to people that come on courses and things. So if we look at the back compared to the top, it gives you an idea about why this um, this, perpend this 90 degree is important. So there's a slight chamfer on this, which is making this look out of place. So I'll just work on the, the back edge to bring that under control. It's not critical at this stage because I'm gonna be taking some more material off here and we'll refine as we go. But that was just a good illustration of what we were doing, what I was talking about earlier. Next up, I'm going to mark some pencil lines. So this is going to be the top of the tail, and that will be the bottom of the tail. Still quite chunky, I can refine it down further from there if I want to. Um, but again, using this technique of rubbing your finger across a reference line <clears throat> and letting a, a, the pencil um, mark show. So if I extend that round the side, you'll be able to see where the top of the tail will be. And if this is the highest point, you can then draw a line to the highest point on the tail. And that's what helps give me this curve that I want in the finished piece, okay? So then, staying with this technique and assuming the top's flat, which it is because we smoothed it off with the horse, um, what I'm gonna do is put a line that's perhaps two, three millimeters all the way around the top of the rim and that will give me the depth of the curve for the the tail section to come into the bowl and then go to the nose if i show you on one of these that's the curve at the top so this point is higher than that point which is kind of what i'm mimicking there and that that will become more evident as we go additionally so we've gone all the way around with that additionally what i'm going to do is look at these facets and choose a point so if you've got a very steep facet you have to choose that um, as the lowest point but i'm going to put a line all the way around the bottom and this will be used to generate the first angle for the curve and then i'll bisect them i'll put a line that's equidistant between the two or in the middle of the two lines and that's one of the first lines that's going to help me with the the carving what you can do is also it's a bit tricky but you can just sort of gauge around on the bottom if, if you can I tend to draw that in by hand once I've done that and that provides the base of the scoop it's not accurate it just gives me something to aim at and then what I'll do is I'll cut this ridge off um, just, that could be a little bit further down if I wanted to um, but that will help with the curve that I'm going to make um, and I'll show you that now so in basic terms we're going to cut between this pencil line and that pencil line which involves cutting this ridge off um, working with the the thumb pivot and a bit push um, cut and um, Again, working in quarters, so I'm working from one side towards the front and then I'll do the other side, turn it round and work the other way. Um, and I'm gonna generate a flat. I'm gonna push that flat forward. You see how we've worked between the pencil lines. I'm gonna push that flat forward, being careful not to undercut that pencil line at the top. You see how I'm moving my hand out of the way every time. So that looks a bit odd at the moment, but once you take this ridge off, it'll help to curve everything around. And then we come to the end grain here. So we start the other side. And readjust. Okay. Uh, it's about consistency and having a facet that goes all the way around. Turn the piece around, 
and then we're going to work backwards into the tail and because there's a, a large portion of wood under the tail you just have to allow those shavings to collect under there and do the same this side you can break them off because they're in my way I'll do the same here so here it doesn't matter whether you cut all of this bit off first and then this bit and then take the middle if you can do it as a, as a flat all the way through that's fine as well so can you see here we're generating a facet that blends into the tail um, the tail now I can just trim a little bit more off and then that facet will go through into here into the tail itself but can you see this is um, tearing up because we're sort of forcing the knife through mm -hmm. the grain so what I tend to do is then just adjust to get a smoother cut so you're constantly assessing grain grain the flow um, yes so I'm trying to control shape but the grain will only let me work certain ways so it will let me work this way because I'm at a diagonal you can see the growth rings so I'm working diagonally across in this orientation I was pushing out and into the grain so I was jamming down it um, and then I'll just readjust and I can make a this is a chest lever cut that allows me to work at an angle and you can see here the markings on the back um, for where the tail wants to be and you can see here the the profile of the underside of the tail isn't great at the moment but we're just looking to get that material away so here's that's the example of where you're pushing the knife into the grain and it just doesn't work very nicely so you change orientation of the blade to get the feature you want and then I can cut that ridge off so we're back to cutting ridges out and that just helps with the profile for now, now I've just noticed there's a high spot here compared to here so this is going off at an angle so I'll just trim that out so it's basically flattening it off um, in terms of assessing the grain yes I understand grain because I've carved a lot of it and um, what you can do is look for clues in how the chips are coming off but also how the surface looks so these are smooth surfaces and um, there's a little bit of um, tearing here um, because the grain hasn't been treated carefully enough um, so the grain the the chip that you get from the knife you know that one not very ragged on the edges thick and consistent I've gone with the grain on that um, here you see there's some feathering that's because I'm coming down from both sides and I've not quite got those lines to meet up so there are clues and the sound as well and the feel if it if it jags if it steps um, that makes a difference so yeah I'm just um, just tidy this up a little bit um, that gives you the um, the first major facet so what we'll do next is carry on and we'll cut this pencil line off and you see this ridge line here And what I'm not doing, I've, I'm only cutting the ridge off, I'm not cutting between two lines here. I just cut the ridge itself off, turn round. You see these are much stabbier cuts because there's very little power needed. There's no support for the wood on the ridge either side of it, so it comes off nice and easily. Okay, it's quite lumpy and blocky at the moment. And then what I like to do, um, I'll just extend that all the way around. Yep. Then what I like to do is cut up to that pencil line. Again, using the tip, fairly thin shavings, you're just shaping at this stage. And resisting the urge to blend and generate a curve. I'm generating facets which I'll then turn into a curve. Okay, and if you can see that against the, the dark earth, but there's, there's one big facet, primary facet, then that secondary which has been softened by taking it all the way up to the line. I leave this um, 
between these two pencil lines because that's the, the flat. So you have a curve that then goes into a straight and the top of the rim is here, but then as we curve down, remember we drew this, this angle, this curved line, the top of the rim for the lowest part of the bowl will be at the, t at the top of this pencil line. So now the next step, Chris. Yeah, so this is the last phase of the initial blending of the uh, of the curve. I'm just looking, there is quite a, a steep ridge there, so I might just take that out in isolation because that primary facet was quite steep. Just blend that in. Um, so now what I'm looking to do is work in quarters, but I'm going to work from the, ri from the base up into this flat um, and hopefully you'll be able to see I'm you know, making a wider facet and it's okay to cut this pencil line off but you don't necessarily need to cut above it. Um, you see how I'm, you might not, camera might not pick it up but I'm sort of rolling my wrist, I'm exaggerating here, you see how the knife is rolling round um, and that just helps to smooth things off and you're, you're basically looking to cut a line and then cut off any high spots. So if I show you this side and you're looking at the profile um, you should be able to see that this is smoother than the faceted surface that I haven't cut yet. I'm hoping the camera is going to pick that up but I'll carry on working so you get a good feel for that. So now just change grip again to smooth and blend over the, the back portion of the bowl and that inevitably will mean carving into the tail stem a little bit as well. Do the other side and again just finding those high spots on the facets that we've um, generated. You have to be careful about pushing the tip here, it's all about pivot so there's no big power or anything put on with your, your holding, your knife holding hand and again leaving those um, chips on there and just starting to look at symmetry. Um, what you're looking to do here really is to get to a symmetrical-ish place. Um, once we've finished carving this wood green, we'll let it dry and then there's the final carve to do, um, which is about getting the surfaces nice and smooth. Um, but you'll also be able to refine the shape at that stage as well. And now what I'm doing is I'm, I'm visualizing the silhouette of the curve. I'm just looking for, for high spots as I work. And that's about turning it sideways. It's harder to do the back edge, but you get a feel for that. Just turning the work around and looking at it dead on as well. You're looking for evenness side to side, which isn't too bad. Need to do a little bit there. Okay. And then what I will do is just thin out that facet a little bit. This is a forehand cut. Um, I can't quite apply the same technique there, so it's quite a, an open thumb pivot. And then you see how we're coming close to the line. Do that evenly either side we're left with this ridge line um, which I can cut out powerful forehand cut just to thin out the, the tail a little bit and staying in that grip now I've got more access with the knife um, I can just and what I'll do is I'll work start the cut further down um, to generate a diagonal rather than a concave There we go, so we're on the line there, not quite on this other side, close to the camera. Pretty much there. And then just blend between the two. Okay. And then just for the last little bit, sort of pivot cut. And then I can chamfer a little bit more, extenuate this ridge line on the back. I'm going to look at the, the ridge here. Now I've got a little bit of a mess here, so what I'll do is I'll just try and pick this line up and make the curve go back round. You see how the outflow of that cut 
then just helps tidy the ridge up and back into the facet that I've just generated. Um, so we'll do the same on this side. And that should push your ridge more into the middle, slightly more even, and then blend, blend the tail back out from there. So I've got a bit of a concave working, working on there. So that's not too bad, it's still slightly uneven. Okay. Did someone mention OCD? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it helps to be slightly obsessive with these. So that's the profile that I've gone for. Okay. And then I'm going to work the top of the tail now. As I said, you can do this with the axe and then redraw your template. Um, I tend to work in the same way as I worked underneath the tail. Just. Um, working not the whole width you want to preserve height and um, between my fingers here and um, so we're looking to sort of tip the tail down a little bit so you can see i'm just working in half inch um, off the edge of the tail once i get down to that line i can then examine the facet that i've generated which will be quite ugly to start with and then blend it out from there so you see how it's quite lumpy here um, what I can then do is just blend into the facet that I've created and that just starts that movement of the top. Now I tend to leave it around there, maybe do a little bit more. But as we carve this portion, um, this line will change so it's a dead flat onto quite a, a clumsy curve but when we add the the recurve the concave the other way in the finishing process um, that line will make a lot more sense and then back through like that so as a final thing while the wood's wet i just i really ought to adjust the template but then it would make the template physically quite weak so i just like to thin the um, tail stem portion out a little bit. I've found that it's an area that can have, carry quite a lot of weight in the finished item. I'll just go backwards and forwards in the grain. I don't necessarily like coming back on myself like that where my whole hand's in the way. But you just refine that line down whilst the wood's still wet. see the difference and do the same on this side it's three or four passes with the knife and then tidy the curve up it just removes a little bit of material because the tail can actually be quite thin uh, in the final piece and then just a little bit more refinement Like so. so yeah that's where I'll leave the outside shaping for now you can fettle it and go a little bit further there's a little bit more thickness there than on this side you can see the the distance from the line but in terms of the video what we're going to do next is use a scorp um, to hollow out the bowl so Chris the hollowing out yeah, and to do the hollowing I use a scorp now a scorp is a full loop of steel um, which is effectively two drawn uh, two hook knives in one. This one is made by Lee Stoffer. It's a it's a slightly narrower blade than standard, and uh, he offered this one to me specifically because of the scoops that I make. And it really is good for for turning round um, in these tight uh, tight conditions. So what I tend to do is work across the grain um, just to get the the hollow working. The the depression going so that's a cross grain cut but then I switch fairly quickly to a pivot cut so I'm pivoting the blade around my thumb 
to work quickly into the, the scoop bowl. And I'm just changing the angle up a little bit to present the tip of the tool, um, which has got a lot of curvature to it, um, which allows me to take big shavings, bigger the shaving, fewer the passes with the knife. And then just start to work around the bowl, bearing the grain direction in mind, and then pivoting up the other way. But um, not dragging, I'm twisting. Um, so if I was to slip, I'd be slipping away from catching myself. So if you only have a hook knife, this is doable, but this tool really lends itself very well to scoops, um, in particular um, because you've got very little flex in either side of the blade because it's supported all the way round and you've also got this tool here. Now you can buy a hook knife that comes all the way back round on itself um, but the tip with an unsupported hook that goes all the way round is very flexible. Um, so if you've got left and right hook knives that helps. Um, if you've got finishing knives um, that are a little bit more open then they might not be so suitable. Um, so just go with what you've got. Um, I'm just a bit fouled on the camera. Normally, I'd I'd do that section around. Like you can get that. Yeah, there you go. And you might find a combination of a roughing hook and a finishing hook will help you, or you just make a shallower scoop. Um, potentially, you can drill out the centre, which might help. Although most drills have a leading point, which you have to carve to the bottom of. You're doing most of the hollowing out, basically. Yeah, go quite a long way with this. Um, the key is an even wall. If we were to have left this without hollowing, the thickness, the amount of timber that's there, um, the, there's more potential for tension, and you probably come back to when it's cracked. By getting a wall going, um, there's, there's room for the timber to move and shrink, um, and it's less likely to crack, um, unless you've got unevenness in the wall, so a thick bit versus a thin bit, um, which again sets up that tension that we keep talking about. So this portion is quite tricky. In an ideal world, you go at it like that, but the grip is quite difficult, and it's working quite well actually. So sometimes I'll use the tool this way, because then if you do slip, your thumb is well out of the way. And uh, I'm looking forward to spending some more time with Lee and getting him to remind me of the different grips he has for his scorps, because he's spent a lot of time focusing on that. But again, it's, it's about working methodically, you know, the, the knife sort of bottoms out a little bit once you've um, carved the shape of the blade. So you move, you release a, a bit more um, by taking a bit of another bit of the scoop out and then you can access better the portion that you just bottomed out. So that was quite dangerous. You see how my palm is in the path mm -hmm. of the blade. So just caught myself there. Oh, bad choice of words, but <laughs> you know, just saw that I was doing that and shifted the grip so that there's no chance. You know, I have to be, I can't come through the wood to get my palm. So I have to come up and out at which point the palm is out of the way. And then just use your fingers. Once you get towards the bottom, use your fingers. And what I tend to do is um, put a little bit of a dimple in the bottom. Um, so you need a little bit um, of decent timber left in the base to be able to put the dimple in. And that just helps it sit nicely on a table. Not all of them sit up straight, but um, it's nice if they do. 
and the reason for that is the weight of the tail can drag the the cup of the bowl off a little bit quickly to get a refine to get this refined down. So this is where the scorp really comes into its own. I can just change the angle of attack um, very quickly um, and work all the way around the bowl. I don't have to put the tool down and pick something else up. It really helps. And because we're going to refine this rim we go quite deep and then adjust the rim so that you get a high spot here and here and a low spot either side and I find that a little bit off-putting sometimes you're like that's that's too deep for a scoop you know stop, stop carving but you do reduce the volume by reducing the rim um, in the, the later carving stages So Chris, the next phase. Yeah, this is the wet, uh, the, the finished wet carving stage for me. I've just looked at a dry example that I'm going to carve next, and I've done a lot more refinement on the tail. You know, you could take all these marks out, but you're going to have to go over this whole thing with a sharp knife to refine it anyway. Um, you know. The tail, I could go down a little bit further, but that's the end of the wet, uh, wet stage. And what I'll do is I'll dry this for a couple of weeks. Uh, again, 20 degrees, room temperature, degrees C, room temperature, not in direct sunlight, not next to a radiator or anything like that. Directional heat will cause the wood to move, and that's where you split. So would you, for example, if you've got shavings here on the floor, right, would you what, put those... You can, yeah, that's one technique. So a loose plastic bag with shavings in. The trouble with birch in this wet is that it can get quite, um, it can go rotten. Mm -hmm. um, I tend to put things in a wicker basket and then panic when I've left them in my lounge and the heating's been on because it's cold and stuff like that. But on a shelf somewhere out of, uh, out of a actively heated uh, environment is ideal. Uh, but a lot of it's trial and error and we were talking about bread making earlier that will change with the season so in some of these take less time to dry um, but you've got higher risk of, um, of splits and things as well so um, yeah just cautiously and not obsessively um, some people um, will pack things in shavings and leave them for months and things just depends on your your application and your experience really and so you've got one that you've been drying out from before. That's right, this one was made uh, end of last year and as you can see, you see I've been talking about the, the thinness of the tail and things like that. Looking at this, I'm wondering if I've already had a carve of this one. There was one in the basket that I started late one night. So I think this one has actually had, you can see the coloration difference, that's mm -hmm. the giveaway. So I think I've already had a go at this. So maybe I should feel less guilty about leaving that mm -hmm. tail chunky. Um, but it is off and I, I might have, started trying to add movement to my work by having these slightly off but that looks like it it's asking for this bit to be carved as well but what i've not done is carved um, the back of the bowl you can see the facets from the wet stage carving you can see this is off so i'm going to take that same mora 106 knife and just try and uh, show you the difference between the wet carving and the dry carving stage. And what you should notice the most is the size of the shavings, the thickness of the shavings are very thin um, and it leaves a nice smooth surface. Also the power, the wood has tightened up significantly. So the power you have to put behind to achieve uh, a shaving is, is increased. Um, yeah, that's not looking too bad. So I'll just do a little bit more on the apex of that convex, uh, concave, blend that down. The sound is different, you can hear that scratchiness, um, it's a bit, bit more aggressive. Um, so then I'll come this way, and then back the other way. I'll watch that camera lens said if I catch that with a 106, the tip of 106, <laughs> I'm not sure whose insurance we'll be claiming on. There you go, so this is really gentle, just backwards and forwards, and that just gives you a fairly smooth line. And just looking at this curve, I want to refine that a little bit more. 
Let's see how we go on with that. That's not looking too bad. So I've got a little pinch point here, a little little angle there that I don't want in my final piece. So I'll just nibble that out, out and blend it back. So yeah, that line's not looking too bad. It's weird doing this out in the cold in the woods. Usually I do all my finishing at home where it's nice and clean um, and warm. But a sharp knife is key to this process. Or if you're going to sand, um, the same applies. If you want to sand this, what's happened is the timber has shrunk. The cells are um, tighter, you know, more condensed, more tightly packed. So if you are going to use sandpaper, allowing this drying stage um, will add to the quality of your finish. So here, this curve I like, it doesn't quite match that one, so I'll do a little bit higher up on the curve and hope that that evens things out for the eye. Yeah, just, just a See, someone that hasn't carved before will pick this up and go, oh, it's not even. You know, a, a novice human eyeball will see the unevenness here. Um, so I like to just get those curves matching as closely as possible to eliminate the chance that someone will decline to purchase one of these because they think my craftsmanship's dodgy. So just gently, just trying to loosen those fibres off. So I'm happy with this portion in symmetry but not this bit here so I just need to nip that out and that comes with experience you know you just sort of you understand how one part of a curve affects the next so the next face Chris I've marked up the rim here, um, so this is about the flowing line. So partly because this is a whale tail inspired item, I want to capture as much of the essence of what the, the animalistic side of what I'm going for. So yeah, it just, uh, just helps. Um, and you can see this line here, which is the one that we carved around the top. That just helps me to keep the distance from the rim to the base of the curve the same uh, on each side. So the grain direction is a little bit funny here. Um, I'm just going to come around one way. You see how it's fracturing? In, a, in an ideal world, you wouldn't allow things to fracture, but I know that I'm going to carve back this way and pick that up. And then I won't take that chip off. I'll use that chip, or that cut that I've just done as the stop cut for it coming this way. Yeah, that doesn't look too bad. And we'll do the same on the other side. So this helps it gives it ergonomics, doesn't it, basically? Yes. No, not overly. Um, this is about aesthetic. So yeah, I mean, there is some extra scoopiness mm -hmm. going on here, um, but actually more about the way it looks. You can see here, I'm going to need to blend in across the top um, and then I'm going to need to do a little bit across the bottom as well. And they're fairly even, which is nice to see. And just very carefully. It just takes a lot of experimentation to get these cuts right um, and just go delicate with the what's called very short grain. So the length of the fibre through the cross section of this wall is really short so it can fracture and break quite easily um, and you just need to be a bit careful with it. Um, but have a play with that. You can see where I've been, what I've been cut out, which directions I've been carving in. Let's see how you get on. So that's an example of going against the grain. I'm losing the light a little bit here as well, which isn't helping. Okay, so hopefully you'll be able to see against the the fleece here, the top line that we've generated, and that's the aesthetic that we've been talking about. 
and the flow for the beast. Fairly happy with that. So now I'm happy with the top line of the rim. Go back to very similar to the earlier phase, working um, around from the, the quarter line forward. And these are just very shallow cuts. You see how I'm basically cutting off the oxidized timber and any dirt and any pencil lines with the very tip of the blade, which takes a nice thin cut. Let's see, just blend that off. So this is the final finishing cuts going in. You can see how thin and wispy these shavings are. Um, and this will allow us to do the final shaping as well. And it's just easy to blend. You're letting the surface that you've just cut, you're letting the blade run against that and then interacting with the high points, relative high points of the faceted finish left in the wet carving phase. So that's from one from one side to the tip and then we'll go from the other cardinal point. Oh, that's a bit far back. Work round. See, I'm working in phases. I'm not traveling all the way around the rim like that. I'm working sort of across in lines and allowing the knife to curve over as we go. So my hand was in the way there. I thought it was worth stopping so I didn't um, get any catch up on my work. Okay, so that's that's the top done. And then if you look at it sideways, I'm looking down at the ground. It's quite a faceted finish. I think given the time constraints and the light, I'll leave that like that. And um, people like feeling the tool marks in the work. And then just working on the back edge. And again, then blending out into that tail stem. picking out the pencil marks that I added for the rim and then we're back into work that I'd previously done. So I've just caught the tip, dragged the tip through the work there which isn't ideal so just blend that out and then onto the last quarter and again the grip here you're working very close to your fingers with the tip but I'm not putting any power on the blade so I feel fairly comfortable to do that, and a little bit of a gap. So having talked to you about working in sort of lines around, I am working a little bit along uh, in the other direction with the back. But that's because the, the outflow of the blade is into uh, uh, into timber. So now I'm going to look at the line around the base. Got a bit of a lumpiness going on this side. So we'll blend that in. And so we've got a concave curve. And I'll just pinch that into a convex. And then line that up with the ridge. Sort of what's going on on the other side as well. And then blend tail out. You hear that little crunchy noise there is the grain complaining. I'm just managing it on the other side. So the top, you've got a low spot here so all this is high so I'll just blend that down a little bit. It gives a bit of a better visual. So 
So I'm fairly happy with that. Just a little bit of tidying up. So I've got a little bit of um, torn grain there. I just want, I, I, I can't let that go. It's messy. So the, the rim here is a little bit jagged and all I want to do is just clean that up and I'm just carving the very tip of the curve because it's the bit you look at. Yep, so visually that's pretty much there. And again, the human eye I'm not carving this for a carver, you know, a fellow carver would forgive you that, but a customer wouldn't. So yeah, that's pretty much the, the top view done. Just can't resist taking a little bit more out here. Uh, that's the top view done. We're going to hollow the, uh, or smooth off the, um, the interior of the scoop now. Yep. So now we're going to um, just take a final cut around the inside of the bowl um, with the scorp and you can see here the, um, the colour is coming off. This is the oxidised layer so I know when I've cut certain portions I work one quarter and turn, work the next and these are very thin cuts. They just taking a single layer around just being careful about the rim thickness and just peel that out let's do in the bottom and then work on the other side And then just this last corner to finish off. And there's just a few little bits. That's a nice and uh, there's a nice thing and a bit of a curse about the oxidisation is you can see exactly where you haven't been. So, and then additionally, can you make out that this is thin, this is thick? So I just need to go through and even that out and I'll do that by carving the top of the rim down a little bit. You see how we're just blending that in and then we'll match it as close as we can on the other side. Okay, that's fairly good, fairly happy with that. So there's two phases left. We're gonna mark out and cut the, the, fl the tail fluke, and then I'm just gonna chamfer the edges uh, while I've got the um, scorp in my hand. I'll just make a bit of a dimple, um, and that just uh, is less functional, but it just helps it sit on a, f sorry, just helps it sit on a flat surface fairly easily. So marking out the tail fluke, I'm going to bisect the line which is roughly there and then draw a little triangle and then what I'll do is I do this by hand but you're looking for a concave into a convex. So we come down from the edge and then back up and then back down to that triangle and the triangle just helps me visually see where I need to aim at. So fairly dainty touch to start to get the curves right and realistically you're looking at quarters you know so you're up and down quarter mark is the trough like so yeah and then if you've got a very small knife it's worth using it I tend to push push into the grain at the bottom there and then come 
I mean, just follow. Um, I do usually use a small knife. It's quite, quite a different experience. That I've got a chip in my hand. So just using the tip, I'm able to peel through. You see how I'm going in and then coming out. By using the very tip of the blade, I'm able to get back up the grain, as it were. That's looking pretty good. And then this side, I'll just stay in the same grip and orientation, so I'll go down the grain and then back up. Let's see, I'm cutting very thin slivers to start with, and a little bit further on. And you need to be careful coming down here because you can jam your knife into the fibres on the other side which doesn't give a great look. And then I'm just going to turn this knife around to come back the other way. Because that's the way the grain wants to work. Okay, so I don't normally have to do this but I'll just go onto the table and just try very carefully not to damage the other side of the fluke mainly because I'm trying to get the camera angle to work and I'm on a very chunky blade. I might just refine that a little bit later, but that's the general principle for what we're going for. And then just make sure that the curves are nice, that the, the tendency is to sort of have a bit of a V and lose the smoothness of the curve here. So we can go straight on to the final phase, which is to nip out the tips of the tail where where it's weak and can break so we do that and then with the very tip of the knife just want to knock off that sharp corner where the flat goes at 90 degrees um, it will take that pencil line off and it will just make it look pretty um, it also serves to protect against um, Uh, dinks so the, the the beveled edge just helps to stop it from getting dented or breaking that edge is weak and it does bounce a little bit of light and it feels nicer in your hand even though um, you've got to look quite closely to see what's um, what's actually going on so we do that at the edge I'm going to do that very just on the tip of the tail as we work round. Okay, and then because of the grain direction, I'm gonna pick up the facet that we've just carved and we're gonna go back round the tail fluke and in here. You can see how small those shavings are. They're literally just the corner of the surface coming off go this way and then back this way get yourself into whichever position feels safest Zed and I are, are sort of moving around a little bit just to get the best camera angles I'm working off a table and normally I'd be working in my lap so there is zero power, you're literally just dragging the tip through the most lightest of touch to get that little corner off. There we go. So that's pretty much the finished item. And what I would normally do with this is put my maker's mark on um, in pencil and then use a, a sharp blade, a corroting blade, just to slice that in and rub some cinnamon in. But that's effectively all the carving done. 
and it's ready once the maker's mark's been added um, to go in the oil. Um, now when I oil I always have a sharp knife with me because I'll look at this afresh and go I don't like that bit I'll just you know there's a little bit of unevenness here so I will just do one last check and refinement um, before the oil. The oil I use is cold pressed linseed oil um, which cures and offers a, a surface coating and um, it can also impart colour especially in birch it, go, it adds a bit of yellowness which you can see in the finished item here that's that's bare wood versus oiled wood um, but the um, the key is um, just to add a very light uh, coating uh, and I use a kitchen roll to do that but just a dab enough to fill the pores and, and coat the surface and then let that dry for a short while and it will be ready for you to use. So there you go guys that is a wrap for this video. Chris I cannot thank you enough. You're welcome. So guys, I know this is a long video and I know a lot of the steps might seem a little bit repetitive the way it was filmed. But here's the one thing I've learned with these tutorials, it's in these little subtleties that you learn quite a bit. So even just watching Chris at work, even as I was filming this video, I'm learning a lot. So I hope you enjoyed this video. There is one thing I want to ask from you. Uh, Chris is a full-time green woodworker, he does this for a living, this is how he earns his income. And what he just showed you here on video, he actually charges people to kind of teach this stuff. So it's a huge honor for me and, and something I'm really grateful for that is allowed me to document this process for you to learn at home. So there's only really one thing I ask you to do and as a way of saying thank you if you gain any value from this video whatsoever and that is to uh, uh, check him out on social media and give him a follow. I'm gonna put a link down below to his Instagram his fan page and also his blog and it will mean the world to me as our way of saying thank you to Chris to go and check that out. Now there's a couple of things I will add. There's a few things um, uh, uh, Chris has mentioned in terms of resources for this scoop. He's also uh, written an article uh, for the Bushcraft magazine um, and uh, a few other kind of like bits and bobs and resources that he's mentioned in regards to these scoops. So what he's done is he's put uh, together uh, an article on his blog uh, that links to everything. So what I'm going to do is link to that article down below on his blog. So if you go and check that out, on that he breaks down, you know, the tools that he's using, etc., etc. And from there you can obviously contact uh, Chris as well. You can find out more about the work that he does. Uh, also on his fan page, he puts a lot of information up. And also on Instagram, yeah, he posts a lot of stuff up on his Instagram. Now here's the thing with his Instagram. Um, as we kind of wrap in this video up now, what Chris has told me is that he very kindly wants to give this away, this scoop that he's actually carved on this tutorial. Yep. So in order to enter the giveaway, <clears throat> what you need to do is go to his Instagram profile and uh, find the image that he's gonna put up. Now, depending on kind of like the timing of when his video is out and when you're watching his video, uh, the giveaway might be coming up soon or it's actually ended. If it's ended, Please do go check him out anyway, because he'll be doing more giveaways in the future as he achieves certain alarm, uh, landmarks on his Instagram following. Um, so the point being is that he's very kindly, unbeknownst to me, said he wants to give this away to anyone in the world, uh, no matter where you are, no matter what age you are. And um, I think that's really cool. I want to enter it myself, <laughs> right? <laughs> Stuff. So uh, in order to do that, like I said, he's going to be doing it via his Instagram. So like I said, the link is below to his Instagram profile. Please do go check him out. Uh, and await the giveaway uh, and it's a fantastic opportunity for you to win a, a genuinely beautiful item. Um, so once again Chris, a sincere thank you. I really do mean it. It's been a long day but Chris has been an absolute trooper taking the time out once again like I said to record this video. So it would mean the world to me. You check him out on social media down below and as always I hope whatever you're doing you have a blessed day, a blessed week ahead from Chris and myself, Zed Outdoors. Peace out. Ha, 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 ha.